Hey kiddos, today we're going to talk about electron configurations. Electron, co electron configurations are so important because remember that essentially all the chemistry that goes on is a result of electrons um, either being transferred or being shared. Everything in chemistry essentially has something to do with electrons, with a couple of exceptions. Um, chemistry essentially is the study of electrons and where they're at and where they're going to and how things are coming together. And, and the reason that they're trying to come together has everything to do with electron configurations. The reason that chemical reactions of any kind happen, the reason that chemical bonds happen is because of electron configurations. Everything here is about electron configurations and how are the electrons arranged. So for instance, when I say that everything revolves around electron configurations, everything, every reaction essentially is trying to get to this column as far as its electron configurations. Everything wants what we call a NGEC or a noble gas electron configuration. Typically speaking, that means eight valence electrons, helium, hydrogen, those are a couple of exceptions. But, but basically that's why everything happens. Covalent bonds, ionic bonds, they're going to happen in order to get to an electron configuration that is the same as that of a noble gas. And why is that? Well, because they're called noble gases because essentially um, they don't react with anything else because they already have the electron configuration that they really, really need. So uh, that's going to lead us into electron configurations. And we're going to talk about the three rules of electron configurations. But first off, I want you to take out a periodic table, okay, as you're taking notes. Um, if you got it up on another screen or another device or whatever, if you got a paper copy, have an electron configuration or have a, a periodic table out in front of you as we're going through this so that you can see what we're talking about. I think things will make a whole heck of a lot more sense if that's the case. So before we dive directly into the rules for electron configurations, I want to talk a little bit about the periodic table and how it relates. So I'm going to label each of these. If you remember in our last video, we talked about um, different types of orbitals. So we said that we had s orbitals that look like a sphere, and we had p orbitals that look sort of like a, an infinity sign or sort of like a little dumbbell structure. And then we had d and f orbitals, and they really started to look really weird. Well, that s, p, d, f, each one of those things corresponds not just to an orbital and a, that goes into our electron configurations that we're going to talk about here in a second, but specifically refers to a part of the periodic table that goes right along with it. And so each of these levels here in what I'm doing corresponds to specific orbitals. So you'll see here that everything I'm writing in this little green region, that everything I'm writing in the green e region is an S. And that means that everything in these first two columns of the periodic table ends in S orbitals. Their outermost um, orbital is that of the S. And that's that spherical one, remember, that we talked about. Okay, and so you should already sort of be getting in your head that, hey, does that apply to these other areas of the periodic table? And indeed, in fact, it does. And so if we come over here, we've got 2p all the way across, and then we've got 3p, 4p, 5p, 6p, and of recent interest to us is that we've sort of filled in the 7p part of the periodic table here really recently. In fact, with our good friend Tennessine um, in there as well. So we've got the S block of the periodic table. We have the P block of the periodic table. And you can sort of already, from knowing what you know from the last video, figure out that there's a D and an F block as well. And so in this region is the 3D. And you'll notice I didn't draw all the individual elements there. I didn't really feel like that was particularly necessary at this point because you've got a periodic table in front of you that you're going to use to follow along as we start to do the actual electron configurations. So the middle region, the valley part of the periodic table there, that is the D block. And I'll come back to why the numbers seem a little weird to you here in just a second. And then down here at the bottom is the F block with the lanthanides and actinides. Okay. And of course, remember how many blocks are here. There are 10 divisions here. There are 14 down here. That's going to be really important to us. So stop and pause and look at your periodic table and make sure that you see those 10 and the 14. Um, once in a while, you'll see 15 down here, and we'll talk a little bit more um, why that is um, as we go on. Um, what, what you probably noticed immediately is that what about that helium up there? You didn't really label that. 
Helium and hydrogen, since they're so small, they sort of have um, some exception capabilities. But helium doesn't like to react. It's a noble gas in that case. But it actually only contains the 1s. Okay. Now, what you will also notice is that as you go down each period, remember that rows are period, periods in the periodic table. And so as you go down each one of them, you are adding another energy level. If we were to draw that in terms of the Bohr model, we would have one little circle, and then we would have a second one, and then a third one, and so on and so forth until we had seven energy levels there associated with that. So we can see that energy levels are going to tie in with our orbitals. Now, we're not going to go too deep into this, but all of these things correspond to something called quantum numbers. Quantum numbers essentially give us an, a, a way to uniquely identify each electron um, within an atom. And the first two quantum numbers are the energy level, so the one, two, one, you know, one through seven here. Um, and then the second quantum number corresponds to the letter, whether it's S, P, D, or F. Um, and again, we're not going to worry too much about that right now, but you need to know that there's a rationale um, and a reason behind what each of those things are. And so we can see that we're going to fill things up in this way. We know, you guys already know from middle school, that if you drew a nucleus and then you had one or orbit around it, one of Bohr's models around it, um, that you would have one energy level. And then you could put a second one on top of that. And you would know that you fill from, you put in your electrons from closest to the nucleus on out. And so if you were drawing... Um, a Bohr model, you've got your nucleus here, okay? And then you've got one, two, let's say three energy levels. And if we were adding electrons onto that, let's say that we were doing your middle school interpretation of sodium, which is right here, and sodium has 11 for its atomic number. That atomic number remembers also its number of electrons if it's not an ion. And so you guys probably in middle school filled these things up and you said, hey, I can put two in the first level, and then I can put eight in the second level, okay? And then we would put the extra one out there on the third level. And that's how you did energy levels in middle school. Well, what we're gonna do today is very similar to that, um, but there's some rules that say, hey, it's not just quite as easy as that, and it also matters not just like what energy level they're at, but what really matters is what orbitals they're in as well. Um, and that's going to lead us into the idea of valence electrons and all of that stuff um, a little bit later. Okay, so energy levels, S, D, P, F blocks, or I would prefer if you said S, P, D, F blocks. You'll notice that there's some weird discrepancies here. So like this is energy level 4, okay, so 4S, 4P, but in the middle there's this weird 3D here. And this is what makes electron configurations a little bit complicated because there are those exceptions there um, in that this is energy level four, but what's going to fill in between parts of four is parts of three. You'll notice that all of the Ds are exactly one below um, where they would be if they were in the S and P level. Um, and one other quick thing that I want to make sure that you note is that remember that your F block actually fits in like right here. Okay, and if you look at your periodic tables or if you've looked at the longer expanded version, you know that all of this slides in here and then we would get this big, long, giant periodic table. So you'll notice then if we put that in that the Fs would, 4F and 5F would go here and that would be two levels below the S and the P there. There's a lot of reasons behind that. Um, there's what we call the penetration effect um, and all of those things that are going to set up um, some weirdnesses for where the electrons are all more than we really need to know in Chem 1. What we really need to know in Chem 1 is, how can I take an element, okay, know how many electrons it has, and then be able to arrange an electron configuration for that? How can I write this out in such a way that I can get, get all of my electrons in the right place? Because I need to know that to know how things react really well. So let's talk a little bit about that.